Hello everybody and welcome to this Exploring Geometry on Polypad webinar. I am David Porras, Head of Content for Mathagon, and I'm really excited to spend some time with you tonight showing you all the ways to explore geometry on Polypad. Uh, as you're getting settled in here, if you want to introduce yourself in the chat, we'd love to hear who's joining us tonight on the live stream. If you are watching this webinar after the fact, welcome uh, to, the, to the video, and I'm glad you're here as well. We'll get started in another minute or so uh, at around two minutes past the hour. Again, welcome everyone. My name is David Porras. I am a middle school math teacher outside of Boston, Massachusetts in the United States. If you want to share in the chat where you are in the world, it's always great to uh, see where folks are joining from tonight. Welcome Prudence. Hi, Kurt from Seattle. Awesome. Glad you're all here. Thanks for coming along. I'm excited to share some ways uh, to use all of the manipulatives on Polypad to explore some ideas of geometry. Again, we'll get started uh, in another 30 seconds or so around 7.02, two minutes past the hour here on the East Coast of the United States. Welcome from Mexico. Awesome. Our first person in the chat outside of the United States. And uh, hi, Stacy from Arizona. Great to have you here as well. All right, well, I'm going to jump in here. Let me um, come on over here. Oops. Hold on one second. Here we are. Hit the wrong button. Sorry, this is uh, mathagon.org. Mathagon.org is free for teachers and students all around the world. Everything I'm showing you tonight is completely open and free. You can explore it uh, even without an account. It is free to make an account if you want to be able to save your work and create teacher accounts and share your canvases with students and view their work, you, you need to have an account. But if you just want to explore and play, you can do that even without an account. So this is mathagon.org. I'm going to hop over to Polypad. Polypad is our open canvas for exploring and creating mathematics. So I'm just going to go to launch Polypad. You can also get there at the top by just clicking on Polypad. You could go to polypad.org, all sorts of ways to get to Polypad. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome from Canada and from New Jersey. Awesome. Great to have everyone here with us tonight. And this is Polypad. It is an open canvas for exploring, creating, discovering mathematics. There is our tile panel on the left. You can see we have categories of tiles, geometry, numbers, fractions, algebra, probability and data and games and applications. We're going to be spending most of our time tonight in the geometry section. I'll show you later on where other where you can find recordings of past webinars on a number of the other tile sections. So let me start in the polygon section right at the top here. You can see under geometry, there are a number of tile categories. And I'm going to start with the polygons. And I'm going to add a few to the canvas. So let me add a hexagon. I clicked on the hexagon, and that got added to the canvas. I'm going to go over to uh, the toolbar on the right and zoom in a little bit just to make it bigger. The other way to add tiles to the canvas is just a click and drag when you start in the tile menu. So here's a square. I want to attach this square to, to the hexagon. And you can see there's like some smart snapping going on. As that square gets close to the hexagon, it kind of snaps in place. I'm going to be copying tiles a lot over the course of the webinar, and there's a few ways to copy tiles. When you click on a tile, this bar that appears is called the action bar, and a number of actions are possible based on the tile type. One action that's always there is copy, so I click copy, and I've made a copy of this square. The other way to make a copy of a tile that's a little bit faster is just using the C button on your keyboard. You don't need to do Command C to make a copy, just click C. So as I'm doing this, I'm clicking C. You can also see there's smart uh, rotation of tiles. In addition to smart snapping, there's smart rotation as well. So here I've made a shape. I'm going to click and drag to select the whole thing and copy it and snap over here. I'll take this whole design. This black circle allows me to do a rotation. You can see I missed the square at the bottom. So I'll grab that again and rotate it. And now I have this shape I've made with hexagon and squares. And a number of options appear at the bottom, one of, one of which is to join. So I'm going to click Join here, and that will form one whole polygon out of those shapes. There's another option to cut it. So I could cut this polygon into two pieces and make 
a couple different shapes. I'm going to be doing join cut a lot over the course of the, of, of the webinar as ways to explore geometry. So I just want to show you quickly how those work. I want to go back to where I started. There is an undo button in the top right. So I could do that to get back to where I started. I also can do Command Z on the keyboard as an undo. The other great option with these tools is the fold net button. So I don't need these squares anymore. So now I have uh, what might look like the net of a hexagonal prism. And when I click and drag, uh, watch how beautiful this is. And I click fold net here. I've shown you the join. I've shown you the cut. The flip does the flip. But the fold net is going to fold this into a uh, hexagonal prism. Watch this. It's so beautiful. Every time I do it, I just get a little bit of joy. And I can, I, I can rotate that prism to see it from different sides. I can use a slider to unfold it. I can stop at any point along the way in the unfolding. Or I could unfold it uh, completely. I'm going to be spending a little bit uh, more time on nets over the course of the webinar. So I will come back to that if I click the actual unfold button, it now becomes a group of polygons again. A few other things just to, sh just to show with the polygons. I'm adding some triangles to my shape now. I'm holding down the shift button to uh, select all of these triangles. I'll copy them and just kind of do a rotation to complete the shape. So there's a shape that I like. Uh, I'm going to do a rotation, hold down the shift button to select a number of the squares and triangles and the hexagon. I'll use the C button to make a copy, and I can make all sorts of beautiful patterns with these polygons. So let me zoom out a little bit. And here I'm off and running in making a tessellation of this two-dimensional space. I can spin it and rotate it. All sorts of wonderful explorations can be done with students in these tessellations. I can find a base shape that repeats and look at the ratio of squares to triangles to hexagons and explore that. So all of these polygons, um, except, for, except for the rectangle, regular and custom at the bottom, all of these top sets of polygons are fixed. Uh, I can spin them, I can move them, I can change the color, I can cut them, but you can't change uh, the size of them. And if you wanna do that, then you'll go to our custom polygons at the bottom. So the first one I want to show you is the green one, which is the custom polygon. And you can, you can see it starts as a pentagon with uh, five sides and five vertices. If I click and drag on a vertex, I can change the size of that shape. If I want to um, increase the number of vertices, you can see as my cursor goes on top of an edge, it changes from the, from the hand cursor to the plus. And if I click when it's a plus, I can add a vertex. So now it's a hexagon, and a septagon, and an octagon, and a nonagon, and so on. And if you get a shape that you're happy with, and you want to share it with students, or you want to use it as part of a project, and you don't want to change the vertices by accident, there's an option to fix the vertices. I'm going to click that, and now it's locked. So I can spin it, I can change the color, I can cut it, but I can't change uh, the size of the shape or, or the shape anymore. Let me just show you one fun thing that I like doing with the custom polygon. I'm going to make it a quadrilateral, so I'll click on a ver. So you, if you click on an edge, you add a vertex. To remove a vertex, um, if you click on it, that vertex goes away. So I'm going to click on this one, and I'll make a quadrilateral. I don't know, something like this. And I kind of like that, so I'll fix it. I'm going to copy it with the C button on my keyboard, spin it around, and snap it in place. And you may know that when you form a shape like this, this also tessellates. So I will join this together, copy it, and just snap a bunch of them in place to also make a tessellation. Now I can do a click and drag on those four. It kind of goes in place right there. It always feels very satisfying when it snaps right in place. I can do this again and stick them down here. And again, I'm off and running and making um, a tessellation here. How fun is that? I've had my students really enjoy making all sorts of creative, clever shapes with tessellations. I could change the color, maybe find an interesting way to do a coloring of the shape that I've made. Maybe make those purple or something. And I could spend an hour just having a fun time with this. We just launched a Polypath art contest, which I'll show you more about in a few minutes. Um, but this was a really quick overview of just kind of the polygons. Um, 
how to join them, how to merge them, how to change the color. I'm now going to dive into some activities, uh, some lessons that you could do with a wide range of students from you know, really young mathematicians all the way up through high school. And so hopefully as I share these ideas, there are, are, are ones that you could see taking to your classroom and using with your students, adopting as needed. Feel free at any point along the way to, to chime in in the chat, ask questions, um, sh you know, anything that, that pops up, feel free to, to drop that in the chat and um, I will answer any questions that you have. All right, so I'm gonna uh, start with a blank canvas again. I just did um, select all and delete and I wanna show you our, our lesson plan page. So at the top here, there is a button called lessons that I can click on. I'm going to open it in a new tab. It goes to mathagon.org slash tasks. Again, you can get there just by clicking on lessons at the top here. And one lesson that I just want to get a link to is uh, Pentomino's perimeter. So I just started searching for a uh, perimeter. Let me go back to our task page. This is a growing set of, I think we're at 140 now, lesson plans, puzzles, games, teaching ideas, um, and so on. And uh, so one that I want to show you is Pentomino Perimeter. I see a question in the chat from Nicole. Is there a way to make a net and then measure it to find the service area? Yeah, there are some ways to find area of shapes. I'm going to uh, come back to that when I explore nets in a little more detail later on in the webinar. So uh, not to put you off, but stay tuned for that. So I'm gonna click on this lesson called Pentomino Perimeters. It's a whole lesson plan. I'm not gonna read it or go through it. You can go through the lesson plan if, if you wanna learn more. I just wanna use it as a way to find a link. So this link here is in the main activity and it's it says, consider sharing this polypad. So I'm gonna open that polypad. This is one that I've made in my teacher account. So you can see there are two answers that are filled in. If you open this, there will be question marks in these blanks because you aren't the teacher that created this polypad, you're engaging it as a student. So I'm gonna copy this link, open it in a um, incognito browser, just so you can see the student experience. So now I'm not, I'm not in my teacher account, I'm not even in, a, in a, a Mathagon account here, and you can see those are question marks. So this, um, this lesson has students use pentominoes to explore the relationship between area and perimeter of two-dimensional shapes. So the first thing that, that I want to point out, all of these things at the top are pentominoes, different arrangements of five squares on the grid. And you can see I can click on a pentomino, but what I'm trying to do right now is, is move it. And you can see that I can't. I'm doing a click and drag and I can't move it. And that's because I've locked these tiles in place. I'll show you later on in the webinar how to do that. But in this lesson, I don't want the students to hit delete on the pentominoes by mistake. They can copy them. So I first, uh, depending on the age of students, I might encourage them to make a copy of the pentomino and then explore how many squares cover each of the shapes. So down here, there was a pink square that is, is able to be moved. So maybe I, 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 I make this shape out of pink squares and I would see that Oh, this took five squares to make that shape. Let me pick a different one. Here's the T. I'll copy that. And students can make this shape, maybe cover it with the pink squares and see that that, that also takes five to cover it. I'm just using the C button on my keyboard to continue to make those copies. So that might be a way to like introduce students to the idea of a pentomino. They're all made up of five. Of course, you could start with just with a blank canvas that has the grid background on it and say, come up with all arrangements of five squares and just let them go and see if they can come up with all 12 of, of the pentominoes. So again, depending on their background with pentominoes and the age, a number of ways to introduce this lesson. But the goal of the lesson is to take two of the pentominoes, make sure they don't um, overlap when you put them together and have students find the area and perimeter of the shape. So this area is 10, I know that it's five and five. And the perimeter here, I, I hit enter, I get a little check here and a little pop showing me that, that I got it right. I could find the perimeter of this shape. Maybe I'll go down to the pen tool and use uh, the highlighter. I'll make it this red color and go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. And so it seems like the perimeter is 14. 
And if I type it in correct, I get another green check. This nice confetti comes down on the screen. I'll show you later on the webinar how to add these blank questions to a Canvas. It's a pretty engaging activity for students. Uh, but then the actual task begins. So this is the introduction to the task. Then what students are actually asked to do in this task is use any two pentominoes to uh, make a shape as long as the pentominoes don't overlap and find the area and perimeter of the two of the combined shape that they made and try to find the smallest perimeter, try to find the largest perimeter. Can they make perimeters of all the numbers in between? And again, these, uh, these set of 12 pentominoes are kind of locked in place. Um, one thing to point out, as you can see here, when I click on this one, there's the action bar appears. There are times where the action bar is kind of in the way. And so there's one option here to pin it to the bottom of the toolbar. So I just want to show you that. I'll be doing that sometimes over the course of the webinar. I'm going to pin this down here, and now the action bar kind of stays at the bottom. So I, I can click on tiles, and the action bar will stay there, or I could get the action bar back up here. So students might pick two, and then find the area and perimeter of that shape. Maybe they'd pick two like this, and find the area and perimeter of that one. And all through this practicing and thinking about area and perimeter, they'll eventually see that the area is maintained no matter which two shapes with area five you put together, uh, the area is 10, but there's wide variability in the perimeter. And, and, and thinking about how to maximize and minimize the perimeter can be an engaging introduction to the relationship between area and perimeter for students. Uh, so let me go back to my account. And I'm going to just go to a blank polypad again. I want to continue this theme of area and perimeter of ways that you can use these tools to help students think about the relationship between area and perimeter. And let me go to a blank polypad again. I'm going to turn on a grid background. So over here on the toolbar on the right, there's an option for grid and display. I'm going to do this large grid. And it could go back to the polygons and use our rectangle tile. So this is a tile with a black handle where I can change the size of the rectangle. It'll always be a rectangle, but it's obviously a common shape to make. So there's my rectangle. Uh, if I'm sharing this with students and I don't want them to change the size of the rectangle, there's an option here under the gear. So any tile has a number of options to it that you can find under the gear. And one of the options you can turn off show handles. So I'm going to toggle this off. And now you can see that I can't change the size of the rectangle because the handle's gone. There are ways to even prevent students from seeing the gear or seeing that option to show handles, which I'll show you about later in the webinar as well. So this might be just a, a square. Let me change the color. Uh, I could make it transparent if I wanted to. I'll do a transparency slider. So this, uh, I changed color in the color picker. And then under these sliders, the bottom one is the transparency slider. But I might start with students just with this rectangle on the canvas and a square here, maybe do a notice and wonder routine, maybe just ask them to predict just by looking how many squares do they think, how many blue squares do they think it'll take to fill up the green square. A great introduction just to thinking about area. I might uh, put a couple in there to help them out, maybe give them some more information. Maybe I'd share this canvas with them. So you could do this in the moment in class. I'm going to go up to the file menu. So I've been in the tile menu here. I'm logged into my Mathagon account. So I can go to file. I'll just call this green square, right? And I could save it. And when I save it, I get a link that goes right to this polypad. So in the moment in class, I could copy this link and I could go post it in my LMS and Google Classroom and Canvas, any way I share links with students, or I could have them make a rectangle of their own. Um, oh, notice I just, I clicked on the green square and my, my it covered the blue squares. I wanna keep this green square at the back. So again, under the gear option, there's a keep at back option. So now these blue squares are gonna stay at the front. And maybe when I share this with students, I just say go explore. And so they could take these and copy them. And okay, so I think that's 10 on the bottom. And now, maybe depending on the age of the students, they might just do this and count how many rows of 10 that it's going to be. Or maybe depending on the age of the students, they want to um, get all of the 10. Now I actually, so let me show you another nice feature. Notice when I click and drag here, if I copy this, I've copied the green square as well. Because on this click and drag, 
I'm highlighting the green square. So I actually don't want to be able to interact with that green rectangle. I just called it a square a few times. I mean a rectangle. When I click on this green rectangle, in addition to keeping it at the back, I'm actually going to lock the tile now. So now when I lock it, I can't even click on it. So now when I do a click and drag and copy it, I can see that I'm filling this up with rows of 10. And what I think is really powerful about many of the tools on Polypad is there's so many great visuals online of what I just showed you, rows filling up a rectangle, right? This just happened, right? I just did all of these. Um, there's great videos that look kind of a lot nicer than this that you could pause that probably have sound effects. And it's nice for students to watch those videos, but this is so easy for students to do that instead of watching an animation of it, they actually do it for themselves. So I'm showing you this right now. In class, I would give students a canvas with many rectangles on it and one square and just say, go find the area of those rectangles with these blue squares. And maybe they'd start by doing a bunch of rows like I'm doing here. Maybe as they explore a little bit more, they would want to have a grid background on and they might say, oh, that's two, three, four, five, six of them, six rows of 10, that's 60, right? And by being able to engage with the tools themselves rather than watching a video, I think it really adds to their deep conceptual understanding of the concepts of area and perimeter. So this is with rectangles. Let me uh, explore a little bit more and show you how I've used this with uh, parallelograms. So I'm gonna turn on a grid background and I'll use my custom polygon to make a parallelogram. I'm just gonna make one in the moment. Again, in class, I would have a canvas prepared. I'll show you an example of one in a few minutes. There's a parallelogram, right? I'm gonna fix the vertices because I don't want students to uh, um, change the size of the parallelogram. And so in my sixth and seventh grade classes for years, I, I did the activity where I, I had students make parallelograms on paper and I asked them to make it into a rectangle and they did what students for years have done. They did you know, the cut move and they cut it up. I'm gonna actually undo that one and turn the grid background back on so I can cut it at a, at a 90 degree angle here. I'm gonna cut it right here. There we go. Oh, I missed. Let me try one more time. I'm gonna cut it here. There we go. And now I take this and move it over here and we've made a rectangle. But I found when my students in middle school were doing it with like paper and glue and tape, the like mess of that kind of got in the way of the mathematics where over the past couple of years when I've done it more on Polypad, students are like enjoying the process a lot more, which is, is, is great. But they're really like focusing on seeing the mathematics and less about, you know, the cutting and the moving pieces around. Certainly there are many lessons where I still use the physical manipulatives and touching and moving is, is, will always be valuable in the math classroom. But I think the examples that I'm gonna be showing tonight are ones where the virtual ones can add a significant amount of value. And so here on the cut tool, you know, I take this and I move it over and um, there's the rectangle. I like being able to see both where when my students did it uh, with paper, right? They've, they've messed up their pal parallelogram. And what doing it here has, has allowed me to do is help students also focus on the relationship of the perimeter. I found like when I when I think back on my initial years of teaching with parallelograms, I was really focused on that the area stays the same. And then I would find that students would think the perimeter has stayed the same as well. And so let me show you some of our, our utensils. There's a ruler. And so I can add a ruler to the screen and say, yep, they both have a, have a base of eight. But when I find the length of the side of the parallelogram, that looks like to be four and a half. And when I put it over here, we know that's four, right? So that the, the perimeter of that parallelogram is changing significantly as I do this cut move. And when I switch to doing this lesson uh, virtually on Polypad, it, it allowed those conversations to happen in a much easier way. So that's a parallelogram. We could do the same thing with a triangle and you take the triangle and double it to make a parallelogram or into a rectangle. Let me show you a really basic canvas that I made that I use with students, not fancy by any means, but it served as a, in seventh grade as a, as a good reminder of how to find the area of parallelograms. Um, so this is it in my file menu. These are all my saved polypads. I'm in my Mathagon account. You can make folders to save your canvases. And the one I want to find is just a practice of um, rectangles, parallelograms, and, and triangles. So here, this is the teacher one that I made that has all these 
spaces where students can can put their answers in to get the checks or X's if it, if they got it correct. So, um, oh yes, thank you, Nicole. Great question. The measurement can be metric. I'll show you that in like thirty seconds. Um, so this is the second canvas that I've showed with these uh, blank boxes to fill in. So I want to show you our our help menu on the right in Polypad. I'm going to click on the question mark. And this first one goes to our help and tutorial page. I'm going to open in, in a new tab. The link is mathagon.org slash PD. And this is, if you're brand new to Mathagon, again, welcome. Everything is free for teachers and students all around the world. This is a good place to kind of get started. There's Polypad user guides. Again, we're focusing tonight on geometry, uh, but there are, are full detailed guides about how to use the tiles of all the other categories. You can watch the videos of our past webinars. We have two more coming up this school year. And then here are kind of tutorial videos, one on, um, on the question builder, Polypad question builder. So you could go watch this five minute video on how to add those questions onto a Polypad. But let me just answer your question, Nicole. I, I put the first question off. Here's the ruler again. Uh, let me make this bigger. And as, you, um, as I zoom in, anytime that you are curious about what options exist on a tile on Polypad, go to the gear. And if I click on the gear, the option is centimeters, inches, and both. So you can have centimeters and inches on the ruler. And that gear is a good place to go. So that's kind of an, uh, uh, an exploration of area and perimeter. Um, let me show you a, a, a quick idea that I've done with Pythagorean theorem, and then I'll jump to some constructions and nets and go from there. So I'm going to go back to the task page. I'm just going to click on, on lessons at the top, and I'm gonna search for Pythagorean. So here's a lesson on exploring the Pythagorean theorem, a couple of videos that you could go watch. I'm just gonna use this to get a link, and this link is Pythagorean theorem template. And so here's uh, a couple of triangles that I made where I built squares on the sides of the triangles, and it's so easy to use the custom polygon tool to fill these with squares, kind of do a notice and wonder and see how the, two smaller squares compare to the area of the bigger square. Again, I've done this for years in my classroom with paper and scissors and glue, and it just becomes a mess and is distracting from the mathematics. But now I've made a square here. I will copy this square and make a smaller one here. And again, I didn't do this for students. I had students do this for themselves. And so they went in and they made the squares. Let me make this one a different color. And then they went and they tried to take these squares and fill in the bigger one. So we can rotate it and fill it in over here. And then we'll take this one. I'm not going to do the whole thing because I think you'll get the idea. But now I can use the cut tool and I can cut this, cut this stuff up and take the leftover and maybe spin this over here, right? And it's like an enjoyable process, right? It's like kind of nice to make all the pieces fit. My students enjoy doing it where I found when they were doing this with like paper and graph paper and little pieces, it felt kind of tedious to them. Where here, they, they really developed this idea of in a right triangle, it fills in pretty close. And then I gave them an obtuse triangle and we did the same thing and saw that these squares didn't even come close to filling up the big square. And then an acute triangle, it overflowed, right? And so these, these tools really allowed them to focus on the underlying mathematics. Uh, if there's time at the end, I will show you some things I've done in exploring the area of a circle with the polygon tools, but I wanna to jump to nets um, because a few folks asked questions about nets. I'm gonna show you some nets. I'm gonna show you some pattern blocks and customization options. Then I'm gonna do some geometric constructions, more like, like high school stuff, how to add labels and do constructions, and then show you some mathematical art uh, and see how much time we got left there. So let me uh, go to a blank canvas. Here, I'll go over to Polypad, go to Discard, and I'll put a bunch of cubes on the screen. So let me, uh, I'll do one, two, three, four, five, six. And you probably see that as a net of a cube. In class, I would just do this and fold it and say, all right, then maybe I would make another one by moving one over here and fold it and then just, allow the students that say, how many nets of a cube are there, do you think? And let them go and find all the nets of a cube um, that they can. But what I really like about this, uh, if I take this and copy it, I'm gonna make two more here and see if you can picture what's gonna happen when I try to fold these other two that I'm making. So I'll put this one over here. And so here's three potential nets of a cube. And 
I don't know about you, but my brain, uh, I've gotten better as I've been working with these on Polypep, but my brain has a real hard time visualizing what's going to happen as these fold. Um, so here's one. I think I showed you this one. This folds. Yep, that makes a cube. What's going to happen here? You might see that it's not going to make a cube, but can you visualize what it is going to make? I'll do fold net. Oh, and you can see it makes like half a box. So I love that it, it actually still folds and I can visualize what's happening as that folds. And this one, what do you think is going to happen here as I do fold net? Uh, yeah, it doesn't fold, it can't fold. So I get this little message saying, this is not a valid polyhedron net. And so what great conversations can you have in class about why are some folding and some not? What's happening here that's causing this not to fold? What other things can you make out of these six that will fold and not fold? Um, so that is, uh, is super fun. But let me go back to the question about, um, about the service area. And let me build, I'm gonna build a um, hexagonal prism here. Oops, I, I'm gonna turn my grid background on and put on a hexagon. I'm going to use the custom rectangle to make a side length of a rectangle. So there's a rectangle. I don't need the grid background anymore. Now I'll copy this rectangle. Oops. Copy this rectangle and put it all the way around my hexagon. I am getting to that surface area question, Nicole. I know it's a good question. And I just saw a message in the chat about the Pythagorean theorem activity. Yeah, I... Uh, I appreciate that, um, Amanda. I found great success in just the, the ease of cutting and filling it up worked really well with my students. I think I'm off a little bit here. Let me adjust that a little bit. And then fold this and see what happens. Uh, I'll make one more hexagon here and put it over here. So this net, I can fold this net. Here we go, fold net. There we go, beautiful. What's really cool when I do unfold, I wanna select all these blue things here and I'm gonna change the color from blue to uh, uh, transparent. So I'm going to move this bottom slider to make it transparent. And then when I fold them, watch what happens. You can kind of see through it a little bit. And the, the other side of the red hexagon is now purple because I'm seeing through it in like a blue tint. Isn't that beautiful? Like this is red, but then there's the purple. I find that really just a, a joyful thing to watch here. The other thing that's awesome, I can do unfold and I can get rid of this side. And is this gonna fold? It should, right? I'll do fold net, zoop, and there we go. Yeah, and, and notice here how cool is this? It's red here because I can see through it, but purple not over there. I think that is uh, pretty fun to explore with students, right? But now to the question of, of service area. So um, currently there is not yet the ability just to click and find the area of these shapes. There are some options that I'll show you. We have some tools under development with polygons where under this gear, you'll have some ways to find the area and perimeter of the polygons just, just by clicking on the polygons. Um, but what you could do, and this will be a nice entry into our construction tools, I can use, so now at the bottom here, this is the first time I've showed our construction tools. Um, I've clicked on this, on this line. I'll make a rectangle here. Let me make it a different color so you can see it a little more clearly. All right, so here's a rectangle. I can make a rectangle. And then there are ways to find the side lengths of those rectangles. So one way, uh, I'm going to go to the pointer, and I click on the rectangle. And under gear, there's a number of label options that you can add to the geometric constructions. I'll show you where you can find all what those labels are. But one of the labels is area. So I can do dollar sign A. Oops. Uh, dollar sign A and then it's finding the area of that rectangle. So I can find the area of the rectangle and do similar constructions with, with the hexagons as a way to think about the surface area. And here you can see that is three. It's, um, I'm really zoomed in here, but it's three of those, right? Uh, fill up that rectangle. All of these squares have an area of one. Yeah. Can you lock the 3D version so students can create the net of it? Oh, cool. Good question. Like, can you not have them um, like unfold it. Yeah, you totally can. Let me uh, get these out of the way. And so here I could um, I could fold the net. And so here's that. And so a couple of options I could do, I could lock the tile, right? So now I can't even click on it. I can't spin it. I can't move it. That might not be great because then students can't spin and move it. So the way to, to unlock tiles under grid and display, one of the options is to edit hidden and locked tiles. So I'm gonna turn that on. So now you can see this little uh, 
like an icon appears on the bottom of the canvas. So now I can, um, I can unlock that tile. Really what I want to be able to do is, is not have the like unfold option on the screen, right? Cause that we just want to be locked. I wonder what happens if I lock position. Does that allow me to unfold it? Yeah, it does. So what, what, what we really want to do is not have the fold option here. And so I'm going to do a deeper dive into this in a little bit, but there's a way to control all the options that, it, that appear in this action bar. And that's on the right under customize UI. So I'm on the toolbar on the right. I'm going to open the customize UI. I'm going to go through this uh, in more detail in a little bit. But one of the options at the bottom under the action bar is uh, fold net. So if I turn this off and then hit save, and then I, oh, oh, it's the unfold option that I want to uh, turn off, not fold. I actually want students to be able to fold it, right? If they build one and fold it, you want them to be able to fold it. I want to turn off unfold. That's what your question was, Stacy, right? Unfold it. So now I hit save and now that's gone, right? Oh, there's the slider. I bet there's a way to get um, undo the slider, right? So let me go back and explore that. But I bet there's a way to get that slider off. If not, uh, we will add a way to get that slider off because that's a great idea. Here's a 3D net. Uh, have students spin it and move it around, but build the net to make that, which would be which would be pretty cool. One just fun example of this that um, I want to show. Well, first, there's a few um, example canvases of nets. So let me uh, go to um, a clean poly pad and under 3D solids. Here are the platonic solids that are pre-built for you. Here's an icosahedron. There's a prism and a pyramid that you can add to the canvas. The other place to get um, examples, which, which my students have a great time exploring, under the file menu, there is an examples and templates thing all the way at the bottom. Uh, so I'm gonna go all the way down to the bottom. These are all my saved folders, right? But all the way at the bottom under examples and templates, under uh, geometry, there's one of all the Archimedean uh, solids. So here are ones that are super fun to explore. This is the one is the soccer ball, I think, right? Uh, we had a tweet of that um, recently. So that would be a fun one to explore as well. Um, my son is a sixth grade student, not in the district where I work. And he came home with a homework question a while ago now um, where he, let me find this example. It was a great use of the tool. Um, it was a Desmos homework question that he had. And it said, uh, what polyhedron can be folded from this net? And so here's a net. He was looking at it and he, uh, he said pyramid. And I asked him why he thought pyramid. And he was like, because I kind of see these like triangles coming together to fold up to make a pyramid. And I was like, awesome. That is a great thought. I can see why you would think that'd be a pyramid. And then I was like, I'm not really sure, Ryan. Can you go build that in polypad for me? And uh, he didn't fully roll his eyes at me. He was like, sure, dad, because he enjoys building things in polypad. And so this was a really easy thing to build in polypad. It was a four by four square, a four by five rectangle, and a three, four, five triangle. So using the custom polygon tool, it took him, I mean, he was pretty familiar with polypad at this point. It didn't take him long and he built it and he folded net. And then he was like, oh yeah, it's a prism. It's a triangular based prism connected by these rectangles, right? And it was such a powerful, like, quick moment to have him identify his misunderstanding instead of me saying, no, actually, when you fold those triangles, they're going to be parallel to each other, connected by rectangles. That's hard to visualize. Instead, he just went and built it, built it himself and then click fold. And as this happened, he fixed his own misunderstanding, which I think, again, is a, um, a really powerful tool. All right. Yes, great idea, Stacy, about the, um, the nets. I might copy that one. Let me keep going here. If you have other questions, please ask them in the chat. I've been kind of middle school based. Let me show you pattern blocks are certainly a very popular tool at the elementary level. Uh, and I'm going to show you how to make really simple canvases for students. So you can see there's a lot of tiles here, a lot of options at the bottom, a lot of options on the right. Sometimes my middle school students get distracted by all these great tiles and start playing and exploring and as the head of content at Mathicon, I kind of enjoy that. And as the middle school math teacher, sometimes I want them a little more focused on the task at hand. So let's say you want to do something with pattern blocks. Well, you first might notice that these aren't um, the same colors that you may be used to with the pattern blocks that you have in your classroom. 
So one of the options under customize UI is uh, under features is alternate tile colors. You might notice the British spelling of colors. Our, our founder and CEO is British, so we have some uh, enjoyable spellings here. So I'm going to click click that option and hit save. And now you see the colors of the polygons change to the ones that you might be more familiar with in pattern blocks. So here's the hexagon. I'm just going to add these to the canvas, the square. We have the blue rhombus and the green triangle and the um, green, uh, red trapezoid and the parallelogram, right? Where's the, there's that parallelogram, right? So that I think is the pretty custom uh, expected pattern block. So I have the pattern blocks on the canvas and then maybe I just want to like have this be a, a standing canvas that I post for students. Anytime they want to go work with pattern blocks, they can go there. And I actually don't, I just want these tiles to be like an infinite pile of pattern blocks. I don't want them to hit delete by accident and then not have the hexagon to work with. So the first option that I want to show you that I've, I've mentioned a few times is the idea of lock position. So I'm going to, uh, I'm going to turn this on and I'm going to do lock position. And now again, as you've seen a few times, I can, I can't move these. I can't hit delete, but I can copy them. Right, so I can copy them as much as I want. Now I want to show you how to get uh, this menu at the bottom much simpler. So all I want students to do is just build with pattern blocks. I actually don't want them to um, have any text on the screen. I don't want the construction tools. I don't want equations. I don't want the eraser. I don't want them to upload an image. Maybe you want them to change the color or not. I don't know, but let me show you how to do that. So I'm going to go over here to customize UI, and that is the toolbar. So obviously move is important, but we don't want the pen or the construction or the text or the equation or the eraser or the image or the color. Let's have them not change colors for right now. Click save and notice now it's just the arrow. All right, so all I can do is move. And now let's talk about over here. I don't want to actually have this whole thing at all. I don't want them to be able to add tiles to the canvas. I just want a place to use pattern blocks. So I'm going to go over to uh, customize UI and I'm going to turn this whole thing off. I just clicked sidebar, gone, click save, oh, and it's gone, just a canvas of polygons, right? All right, let's keep going. We don't want kids to cut this, right? Because that all of a sudden messes up the pattern blocks. In fact, I don't want them, I guess flip is important, right? But I don't want them to cut. Let me undo that and put it back together. Uh, we don't want them, I guess we do want to delete because these I can't delete, right? It's really the cut feature that I don't want. So I'm gonna go back over here to customize UI. All of these things at the bottom are all the actions that appear for certain tiles. The one I just want to get rid of right now is cut. I could go through and decide if I don't if, if I want to turn a bunch of those off, but I'll do that. And now the cut is gone. And maybe over here, what are some ones that I don't want over here? Uh, so I'll go back to customize UI. These are the features. Do I want them to copy paste? Yes. Delete, rotate, snap. Absolutely. Go to full screen. Yes. Undo. Yes. Put on a grid. Yeah, it could be helpful with pattern blocks. Uh, so all of these might be helpful here. So let's just do save. Now uh, I would save this polypad. I just hit save with a command S. This menu has gone, so I can't save it anymore. But I just hit save. And now at the toolbar, I have this link. And I can take this link and share it anywhere I want. I'll actually get rid of this and hit save. And I'll share it. In fact, let me put it in the chat of this, um, of our, of our webinar. So here's that link in the chat and you click on that and you'll see it's just those, just those pattern blocks. And so it took a little bit of work here to, uh, you know, add all those features in, in the customized menu, but it's, it took me two or three minutes. It might take you a little bit longer the first time, but it's really nice to be able to add all those custom features. Um, let me just show you how to get this back on. So now I want to move on. So I want my tile menu back and I just did like a refresh and it's there because it saved uh, my last settings. So now I'll go back here and I want the preset of everything. I want to turn everything back on to continue the webinar. So I click that and hit save. Uh, Stacy, will those changes feed to the student copies if done while they're working on it? Nope, it will not. So it's not um, live updates. Uh, that link that I just like shared to you, if you make changes to it, I'm not going to see that. If you want to save your work, it'll save it to a new polypad canvas with a, uh, a new URL. 
Uh, one of the biggest features people have asked for over the, over the year is multi-user uh, work on the same canvas at once. And so that's a feature that we are hard at work on behind the scenes, the ability to um, have two or more people working on the same canvas in, in real time. So Stacy and I could be working on the same canvas, or if I, I could open a student one and move things around and add tiles, but not there yet, coming soon. All right, uh, let me end with some constructions and then mathematical art and then some plugs for things coming up. So I'm gonna go down to our um, constructions here. So I'm now focusing on construction tools at the bottom. I'll, I'll make sure it's black so you can see it best. And I'm gonna first just like draw uh, two lines to make an angle. So there is an angle that I've made. Um, again, we can find all sorts of labels, but I wanna actually build an angle in here. So there's, there's a, a way to, to, to visualize that angle and measure the angle. So under the construction tool, I'm gonna to click on angle. And once I click on the angle, I'm gonna click on the three points that make the angle in a clockwise direction. So I've clicked on angle here. I'm gonna click on, on this vertex first. Nothing happened because I just chose one. The uh, like center vertex of the angle is two. And now you can see there's this angle that's being formed as I move it around because I haven't identified where the angle is going to stop and I want it to stop over here. So now I'll go back to my move tool and I've constructed an animation of this angle. So now as I, as I make the angle bigger and smaller, it'll make a box at a 90 degree angle. The size of the opening is changing. And I just think I, I was doing angles a week or so ago in seventh grade. And just being able to do this really easily and see the size of the opening change, I think was a really simple, powerful visual for students. Uh, I want to measure that angle. So first I'm going to just change the color a bit. I'll make it purple. And the measure for degree under label is dollar sign B. So there are, uh, and now when I do that, there's a 45.6 degree angle. So I can move it all around and go back to zero. And, you know, then I said, students, go build a two degree angle, go build a 97 degree angle, go build a whatever degree angle that you want. And then I haven't showed you the protractor. Here's our protractor. It snaps in place just like the polygons. So I could put the protractor on top and see that, yeah, indeed, that is a 51 and a half degree angle. Um, you can flip the protractor so the numbers appear in different places as you like. Let me continue this. Actually, let me pause here and show you where to find all these labels. So I'm going to go to mathagon.org slash PD and go to the geometry tutorial. And all the way at the bottom is our tutorial on constructions. So this I've been talking about all night, so I'm going to fly to the bottom. And here's a video on the constructions that you could watch. But more importantly, here are all of the labels. So uh, I think I showed you dollar sign A was area. You can find length of a line, circumference, perimeter, degrees. I can measure the angle and radians if I wanted to. So you can go back there to find that. Uh, but now let me uh, connect these to make a triangle. So I'll go back to the line tool, make it uh, black just to complete my triangle. Oh, I'm on angle, not line. There we go. And there's my triangle. So I've made a triangle. I could uh, label the side lengths of the triangle. So let's do... Uh, dollar sign L and this one, uh, dollar sign L and this one, dollar sign L, and a great way to explore the triangle inequality theorem. There's a, a whole lesson we have on breaking a line in two random places and getting those to uh, see if those can build a triangle. But once you have these in place, you could also measure the angles. You know, can you build a triangle? 10, 2, 3. All right. Let me try, like that's not gonna work, but here's 10, and I think to have students try to build it, all right, here's two. Is there any way the other one could be three? No way, right? If this is my two, I'm going down, can't do three. So just to be able to do that and explore the triangle inequality theorem, I think uh, can be powerful as well. I put this out on uh, Twitter the last like day or so, so you might've seen it, but uh, a really nice way to explore the sum of the angles in a triangle. Um, I'm gonna click on this line at the bottom here, and you can see I could find the midpoint or the perpendicular bisector or a parallel line or a perpendicular line. I want to find a parallel line and you can see I can move it anywhere I want on the screen, but I want to attach it to this point at the top. So I've made a parallel line. 
I'm going to go to my custom polygon here to make the triangle. I only want three sides. So here is uh, that triangle. And I'm going to take this triangle and now use the cut tool and cut these pieces off. I'm actually going to make it a different color. So I, I'll copy it and maybe make this one blue. And so here's the angle. Oh, that was the triangle. Here's the angle. I spin it around, zoop, and that will fit into place right here. Oh, it's so lovely. And when I cut this one in a similar way, we'll make this one a uh, reddish color and copy it. Oh, I keep picking the triangle. There we go. And spin this one around. That'll fit right in place right there. And what a really, oh, I'm off a little bit. What a really great like uh, visual that the sum of the angles of a triangle is 180 degrees. And again, I think the power of these is not watching me do it like you're doing it now, but having students do it. And so you have a class of 25 kids and they all make a different triangle and they all do this and all of the triangles fit into place and they go around and look at it and say, oh, no matter what size triangle that you have, this move works, right? The sum of all the angles in a triangle adds up to 180 degrees, um, really cool. Uh, I want to, um, there's a video here of the invisible option, which I am, um, if we had more time in the webinar, I would, I would, I would do this, but I'm, I'm mindful of the time. And if you do geometric constructions and are interested in bisectors and perpendicular lines and medians and finding the points where all these meet, I would encourage you to spend three minutes or even speed it up and watch it in 90 seconds to go explore this video. It's um, really a, uh, a cool tool. I have not spent any time tonight talking about kind of mathematical art. Um, I want to show you some of these other uh, tiles we haven't even talked about. We have tangrams and pentominoes and tetrominoes, penrose tiles. Look at all these beautiful like artistic tiles. They're so wonderful to explore. Um, you may know that a um, in a Penrose tile, all of the, let me uh, zoom in here, right? All of the circles and lines have to match up to be like a valid uh, shape. So I could do that. I mean, that snaps together, but the circles don't match up. But there's a valid connection because they do match up. Um, when you do it like this, what's pretty, pretty beautiful about uh, the kite and dart is they make a non-periodic tessellation where there's no cycle of something that repeats. I showed you at the beginning of the webinar a tessellation where it's the same shape repeated over and over again. These make non-periodic tessellations. These nature tiles are beautiful to explore. We have a whole section. Oh, these pentagon tilings, right? Um, you may know that normal pentagons don't tessellate, uh, but these pentagon tilings do tessellate, right? So you can use these to make um, uh, to make tessellations out of these 15 tessellating pentagons. The last one of these was discovered just in 2015. So it's an example of new discoveries being made in recreational mathematics all the time. And then under patterns and art, we have, uh, we have tantrix tiles and fractals and column tiles. And again, if you go to the geometry tour tutorial, here are beautiful examples of these. Here's one with the Penrose tiles. How beautiful is that? Uh, here is one, um, where did that go? Uh, there's the nature tiles. Here's a beautiful example of the column tiles. So go check that out. And all of this as a nice plug for our ongoing uh, newly launched Polypad art contest. So mathagon.org slash art contest. I found that by clicking on this little, uh, this trophy on the right. It's open to students around the world to submit any piece of uh, Polypad created art, uh, three categories. We have cash prizes. Here are some ways to get inspired. You can learn about tessellations and fractals, um, as well as explore some more along the way. Um, I am mindful of the time. I want to leave a few minutes for questions, but I encourage you, if you haven't already, to uh, visit these two resources as you want to learn more. This is mathagon.org slash tasks which is, again, our library of over 140 lesson plans, tasks. There's a whole one on fractals, how to build beautiful, wonderfully deep mathematical fractals. We just launched a puzzle on Mondrian rectangles, which are wonderful to explore. There's Curry's Paradox, which is a great uh, geometric puzzle. We have reptiles. Uh, which are uh, another fun tessellation. So go go check those out. And then please keep in mind mathagon.org slash PD 
as a, a great place to go as you explore. If you're just, again, getting started, we have some getting started pages. Maybe you're a third through fifth grade teacher. This is kind of like a welcome page and some ways where um, Polypad and Mathicon might be really helpful in the third through fifth grade classroom. We have all of these user guides. If you're exploring with a tile, maybe you're, you're doing something on numbers and it's not working, go check out the numbers tutorial. Oh, that was a new window. And uh, you can learn all about the number tiles. Um, we have three more webinars coming up, uh, two more coming up this year. We're here right now, exploring numbers and fractions in two weeks. Come on back. Uh, and then in June, we're gonna have a number of teachers share how they've used Polypad in their classroom over this past year. So that was a wonderful webinar last year. All sorts of great ideas were shared. Again, these are the uh, video tutorials, how to add classes, how to share Polypads with classes, how to embed Polypads, all sorts of kind of the nuts and bolts, which I just barely talked about tonight. These are pretty short videos. And we've had an a amazing uh, guest speaker series over this past year. Desiree Harrison was two weeks ago. The link will be up here soon. It's on our YouTube page. Um, and Jennifer Saw is coming up in a couple of weeks. And some of these uh, ones you can go watch as well. Um, so it was a real pleasure sharing some of these ideas with you tonight. Uh, you're still here, which means there was something of value. You can leave a, a YouTube live stream anytime. So um, thanks for uh, thanks for sticking around. One final thing to say is as you're exploring, keep, ex keep uh, coming back to visit our What's New tab. So just in April, we added coins, uh, US coins, euros, and British pounds. We added random number tiles. We added big improvements to our fraction bars and coordinate systems. I didn't share any of those tonight because this is a geometry webinar, but uh, continue to explore um, the what's new section. And uh, let me drop our, um, our Twitter handles in the chat. Our main account is mathagon.org on Twitter. All sorts of updates come out there. And I'm at David Porus. Um, and Kristen has a great question. Yeah, a colleague noticed Mathagon.org is owned by Amplify and asked me if the plan is to keep Mathagon free. Crossing my fingers that this will be accessible to all students. You are you are correct. It will always be free for teachers and students. So um, Amplify acquired Mathagon in October of this year. And uh, part of the agreement that everyone was really excited about was that everything on Mathagon um, will be free for teachers and students around the world. So um, yeah, I know. Let me uh, put that up there. Yes, I agree, Chris. It is very exciting. Um, well, these are really powerful tools that I think are helping students engage in really deep mathematics around the world. And so everyone at Amplify and at Mathagon is really excited and invested in continuing that. Nicole, will we add Canadian money? Yes, that is on the list of things to add where we are still working on the... Um, on the art for the for the Canadian currency. But when we were looking at currencies to add, I think our uh, country with the second most users after the United States was is Canada. So we are excited to add Canadian currency and hope to have that uh, coming soon. Uh, so stay tuned. Um, any other questions, drop them in the chat. Again, thanks for sticking around. Uh, please share on Twitter or on Facebook or on uh, Instagram or other social media platforms, what you're doing with Polypad in the classroom. We love seeing what teachers are doing and sharing of ideas is great. I think it was uh, maybe Stacy who shared the idea in the chat of like freezing the net so you can't unfold it and trying to build it. Awesome idea. Thanks for sharing that with the more we learn from each other uh, is great. Um, feel free to get in touch with me uh, via support at mathagon.org with any questions or things that aren't working. And uh, again, thank you so much. It was a pleasure sharing some math with you tonight and uh, hope to see you at future events down the road and maybe uh, in-person events eventually. So I'll stick around for another minute. If you have any questions, yeah, my pleasure, Kristen. Uh, it's always great having you come. Kristen's been to many of these, so uh, hopefully it's not too repetitive for you, Kristen, but uh, we're, we're doing these as like introductory, but it's great to have you. Really appreciate your coming. Um, my pleasure, Amanda. Thanks for thanks for coming. Glad you found it helpful. Thanks again, Kurt. Yeah, my pleasure. All right, I will end the broadcast. And uh, thanks again, everyone. See you down the road. Have a great rest of your day or evening, wherever you are in the world.